Welcome to the study of God's Word recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now let's open our Bibles and study God's Word. Amen. All right. So, uh, Pastor Ed touched on an important principle last week. I heard in one of the services on, as I was passing by downstairs in children's, I don't remember which one it was, but it went something like this, that it was based on Matthew chapter 5. Jesus gives us a promise uh, in the middle of the Beatitudes, and he says, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. God never holds out on you. God's not holding back. If you're hungry for him, if you're thirsty for him this morning, he will move in your life. It also goes on, and Pastor Ed alluded to this, that in the physical, you eat when you get hungry, right? Your stomach rumbles, you feel a little bit faint or whatever, you feel hungry, and so you go and find something to eat. And that's how it works in the natural. But in the spiritual, as you eat, you get hungry, as you spend time with the Lord, as you commune with him, as you spend time in the word, as you allow the Holy Spirit of God to move on you and to speak to you, it creates an appetite for more. You should never come away from a time saying, you know, I think I've had enough of the Lord. I think I had my fill. I think I'm done for right now. And I know from the first two services and talking to many of you that there's a lot of people uh, that are a part of this community that are going through incredible difficulty. That may not be you this morning, and that's great, Uh, but it might be. It might be something that you are going through. And I want to encourage you as you go through that, sometimes the Lord wants you to just wait. It's uncomfortable, but he has something for you. But there are other times where the Spirit of God begins to stir you and rise up in you. And he wants to do something in your life that you're going to have to contend for. You're going to have to take a stand. You're going to have to step forward in faith and allow the Lord to have his way in your life. At this particular church, we have a vision, we have a motto, and it's very simple. It just says, when, disciple, and send. We want to introduce people to Jesus. We want to teach them who he is. And then we want to scatter the church out so that way they can tell other people about who he is. And so just as the body is made up of many different gifts, The body is also made up of many different phases of life and generations. It's made up of people who are farther along in their walk, people who are newer to the Lord. And each generation, each phase of life has something different that you can learn about the Lord. If you're taking notes, I want to encourage you to do an exercise. I want you to write down one, maybe two people, and just keep the list short, that have had great impact on your life spiritually. I want you to think through that. What is the legacy that has been left to you? What is your spiritual heritage? Somebody who has spoken truth into your life at a crucial point. Maybe there's somebody else who uh, just walked alongside you, more of a ministry of presence. But I want you to consider that and write that down. Then I also want you to consider... As you pass through life, as you pass by others, in your job, at school, at work, wherever you go, what is the spiritual legacy that you are leaving behind you in your wake? What are the things that you would hope to leave behind? And is that happening? And I think it's a helpful exercise because a lot of us don't think about our legacy until we hit the end of our life or we sense that we're near the end of a season. And what happens is that doesn't leave you a lot of time to then do something about it. But the Bible teaches us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The Bible wants us to be mindful and aware of what is going on. So as I did this exercise, I thought through some things, and uh, one of the first ones that came to mind was my grandfather. And my grandfather has gone home uh, to be with the Lord, but when he was here, Uh, He was very faithful. He had dyslexia. It was difficult for him to read. But I remember at 5.30 every morning, my grandfather would get up and he would spend an hour reading the Bible. Didn't come easily to him. 
It was very difficult. He never even finished junior high. But he made that time with the Lord, that appointment for God to speak to him and have his way. But you see, my grandpa did not like pastors at all. <laughs> he had been burned. He'd been in some unfortunate situations. He was not a fan. Uh, and I remember, I didn't know that. I was seven, maybe eight. And I came to my grandpa and I said, Grandpa, I think I want to be a pastor. Well, it's not really the vision he had for my life, but uh, he was not happy. He got very stern, got very quiet. I remember him coming over to me and grabbing both of my shoulders, not aggressively, but gently, and just saying, boy, if you do that, you better take it extremely seriously. You see, we don't play around with our faith. This isn't something that we hold loosely to. It's not a time of the week where we show up and we have uh, spiritual fantasy or we do make-believe or any of that. Jesus is real. Jesus is moving. Jesus is here in the room. He's praying for us, the Spirit of the Lord. And so another one I thought of, I had a friend who was a pastor who was a World War II vet. He married his wife when she was 16 and he was 18. Pearl Harbor happened two weeks later and he went and he fought in the war for the duration of the war. He was not a believer when he went. He became one uh, throughout the course of the war and he came home different. And I asked him, if you were going to impart something to me, what, would, what advice would that look like? I want to be a pastor. I was probably in high school at this point. And he goes, you know, over the course of your life, you'll have many things that vie for your loyalty. You have many things that want to have your energy, that will seek to draw you in and suck up your time. And I would encourage you that that energy and that loyalty and that time is given to you for Jesus. It's not given to you for ideas of man, fads, trends in the culture, politics, whatever it might be, things that we give our energy to and we put all of our life, we pour it into, that belongs to Jesus because Jesus is worthy. And Jesus has given us something when he bought our life for a price. And following Jesus is both costly, it's also disruptive, but it's also beautiful. The Lord has called you to something beautiful. And when you follow him, you don't pay the price just once. Discipleship is paying the price and paying the price and paying the price. You take up your cross daily and you go after Jesus. Not because Jesus wants things to be difficult, but because things are difficult and he invites us to partner with him, to die to ourselves. John Wimber, who was a pastor, he said this about discipleship. The economy of the kingdom is quite simple. Each new step will cost us everything we have gained to date. Every time we cross a new threshold, it will cost us everything that we now have. Every new step may cost us all of the reputation and all of the security that we have accumulated up to that point. And a disciple will always do that. Psalms 145, we read this morning, but verses 4 through 7 in the message read like this. Generation after generation stands in awe of your work. Each one tells stories of your mighty acts. Your beauty and splendor have everyone talking. I compose songs on your wonders. Your marvelous doings are headline news. I could write a book full of the details of your greatness. The fame of your goodness spreads across the country and your righteousness is on everyone's lips. You see, I cherish the stories that have been passed down to me as a younger believer and as I'm growing, I have kids, I want to really understand how I can make my floor their ceiling. I want my kids to surpass me in devotion and love towards Jesus and understanding who he is and what they will do to follow him. That is the goal, to instill courage, to instill expectancy into the next generation. They come across something they've never been to before. They don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And so somebody older who's a believer who's been down that road can say, you know what? The Lord has the power to heal. The Lord has the power to speak to that. The Lord has the power to get you out of this situation. And what you do is you take your heart and your faith and you place it 
into the next generation for them to carry forward. You see, our country is in a place of a lot of turmoil today. We see economic turmoil. We see spiritual turmoil. We had COVID, the fallout of that, the war in Ukraine, what's going to happen in Moldova, all these different things that are going on around us. But you know what Jesus doesn't feel? He doesn't feel fear. And we have not been given a spirit of fear. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We want to be a people who are pregnant with the purposes of God that the Lord is doing something inside of us that we can't contain. But you see, if the mission is always somebody else's job, then we're never doing the mission. And so Jesus wants us to contend for those that are around us. And where the presence of God is, the church is glorious. But when the presence of the Lord or the people ignore what the Lord wants to do, they don't allow him to move, what is left behind is scary. Churches end up being buildings that become museums. They become monuments to the past. They become mirages of life in the culture. And what ends up happening is they taunt the lost with life, but they never impart it. People come searching, and they don't find Jesus. And we don't want that to be said of us. And nothing will work as hard against you as apathy. And that's ironic but it's true. So we find ourselves in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 1, context, Eli is a judge. He is the priest uh, who has become the high priest, who has become the judge of the nation. The judge is a leader. The last judge that we read about uh, was Samson. Samson died by suicide. He had great moral failure in his life. The Lord used him at times, but Samson did not always make himself available. The Philistines had the entire nation under their thumb. And so we see Samuel, or not Samuel, I'm sorry, Eli, rise to prominence within the culture. And we don't know the whole story, but at some point, the people of God were no longer dominated by the enemy. But the problem was, the priests had gotten lazy. Eli had a great ministry but he wasn't a great dad, perhaps. His kids were priests at the temple in Shiloh, and they were awful people. They would come against the Lord. They would blaspheme him. People would get drunk in the temple. They would literally sleep with women on the doorstep of the temple, it says in 1 Samuel. Zero fear of the Lord. No respect for who the Lord was. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12 says, Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. And these were the religious leaders. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, the result is the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Translation, ministry, messages or ministries of God were hardly ever heard or seen. The spiritual life in this country went on and on and on in the liturgy and the methods and the traditions that they had completely by the flesh. The Spirit was not leading the sons of Eli. And that's scary for us this morning to think about. In some places, there are lots and lots and lots of churches that are run without the Spirit. And guess what? A lot of people don't even know. They don't even miss him because they don't know what to miss. Maybe it wasn't imparted to them by a generation before them. But ministry without God is scary. So 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 7, or verse 1, it says, Now there was a certain man of Ramathim Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, and the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other was Penina. And Penina, 
or sorry, Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. So this man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write a thought for me. As we're talking about contending and the Spirit of God rising up in you, Elkanah was a faithful, faithful man. The priests were corrupt. Everyone knew it. It was an open secret. And so, Elkanah would have had every reason not to go up yearly and worship. He could have found an excuse, had been to that church, the hypocrites, whatever. But Elkanah knew that just because somebody chose to not walk with the Lord was not a reason for him to abandon God. So year after year, he was faithful. He would go up, he would worship the Lord, he would take his two wives. Now, two wives are not what the Lord would have. Anytime you see polygamy in Scripture, you see tension, you see struggle, strife, you see family issues. But even when we invite difficulty into our family, God still wants to heal that. And God was still honored by Elkanah coming up each year to him. And so Elkanah was making a choice that, you know what? Um, I'm not going to go by what I don't know, because I don't know why these guys are in charge, but I am going to stick to what I do know. And I do know that God is good, and he's worthy of my worship. So if you're taking notes, the first thought I'd have you write down is contending faith doesn't work with what is, but rather what should be. We don't walk by sight, right? Contending faith doesn't work with what we see, with what is. We don't give up. We don't get discouraged because something is an obstacle and it comes up in our life. Jesus promised us that living in this world, we would have many trials. But faith works based on what should be. Jesus taught us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want to see the kingdom and the will of the Lord established here among us in our culture. Samuel Logan Bringle, who is a Salvation Army commissioner, wrote this thought. He said, in order to bear the same type of fruit, we must become the same type of tree. We have to conform. You see, fruit doesn't just appear in your life. It has to be tended. It has to be nurtured. You don't just walk over and pick something off the tree that you've never invested in. You have to pay attention to what you're doing. And Alcana was doing that for his family. And people in the culture, it sounds like, were largely going along with what the priests were doing. And so what was happening was a corporate industrial model had hijacked the ministry model that God had for his people. And people were not getting the Lord. They were getting tradition methods that they lacked. And sometimes this happens in our families. It's easy for us to stop bearing fruit, for us to get out into the weeds, for us to feel like we're doing well at ministry or the Lord is happy with something in our life, but we neglect, maybe not on purpose, the ones that he's given us in our home for us to take care of and tend to. But when we share our story with each new generation, it's powerful. So we'll pick up here in verse 4. And so it carries on and says, Whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. She has at least four, right? It's plural. At least two sons, at least two daughters, maybe more. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion. For you see, he loved Hannah. And it says that he would give her the double portion, although the Lord had closed her womb. When Hannah would go up to worship, Panina would go with her children, and she would see that, and Hannah would go alone. And Hannah would enter the house of God by herself. Verse 6 says, And her rival also provoked her severely in order to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it was year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. You see, Elkanah wanted to lead his family, but there were some things that were out of the orbit of his control. He could not give Hannah what she desired the most. 
But what he could do was be faithful to the Lord, be faithful to this legacy. And we see when God moves in their family, we'll see the birthing of a great prophet. The Lord will move through Hannah and Hannah's faith to bring about redemption for an entire nation. If you've seen the movie, the World War II movie, Saving Private Ryan, you'll be familiar with the scene where they storm Normandy. They're coming, they land on the beach, there's machine gun fire coming, and they're running up the beach, and people are getting mowed down. More people are not making it than making it. There's a similar parallel here to the culture, right? Because there is a wide road that leads to destruction, and there's a narrow road that leads to salvation. And in the movie, as this is happening, Tom Hanks plays the sergeant, and he goes, and there's a, a grenade that goes off right next to him, and he, he can't hear. His ears are ringing, and a private is panicking. He's fearful. And he runs up to him, and he says, Sir, where is the rally point? And Hanks yells back to him, Well, anywhere but here, right? We're taking fire. This is not sustainable. We can't stay here. We're not going back to the boats. We're not staying here, so we have one option. So they move up the beach to a sandbar, and the private says, no, 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 no. That's scary. I'm staying here. And Tom Hanks says to him, you can't. We have to clear the beach for those who are coming. You stay, you die. We contend not only for what we see going on right now, but for those who are coming. Alcana, as he was moving forward, was not just worried about who was there already, but he would lead Samuel, who was not there yet, to go into ministry and redeem the nation. And so what we see is Elkana and Hannah, when they would go up year after year, they believed in the vastness of God. They believed in a big God. They believed in a faithful God who was good. There was a lot they didn't understand, uh, and that was hard for them, but they still pursued him. And so he would give her the double portion because he had great love for her, and the Lord had closed her womb. We don't read that she wasn't able to reproduce because there was anything wrong with her. This was a timing thing. The Lord was having her wait on his timing. That's extremely difficult to do, but God was actually at work in the waiting, accomplishing something in her. And so we see that it's strange. Panina has terrible character, and she has tons of children. Hannah, pretty awesome lady, loves the Lord very godly, has no children. And on the surface, this would be very hard because in the culture, it was said that every woman hoped that the Messiah would spring from her line, that she would bear the Savior of the nation. So there was a spiritual component. And if you couldn't reproduce and have children, culturally, they believed that there was something wrong with you. God was against you. But you see, that, that wasn't the case at all. But Hannah didn't know what was going on. And so and when she would go up to worship, and they were faithful to do this, Panina would take this opportunity to dig at her in her most vulnerable and painful places. And what would happen in the inverse is that it would then drive her to weep and she wouldn't eat because she had no appetite. And so they would worship and then she would cry. And I wonder how many of us today are here in the house of God and you're miserable. It's possible to be crushed in your spirit, to be brokenhearted, to show up and people ask you, how are you? Oh, I'm good. Bless God. And inside, we know it's a lie. We're, we're hollow. We're hemorrhaging. We're struggling. Proverbs 13, 12, it says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. And so in this season of struggle, it was hard, but she persevered. She went with Elkanah each year. She did her duty. She was there. And then she would grieve. If you're taking notes, the next thought I would have you consider is that contending faith isn't focused on competition, but sustainability. She could have lashed out at the Lord, being upset. You can control this. Why aren't you? She could have lashed out at Panina every year. 
every time, like, Benina, you're, you're the worst. Or she could have lashed out at Elkanah. Even though Elkanah loved her deeply, you know, she could have been upset with him or irritated. But what we see is Hannah goes in the pra- her, her prayer closet and she contends with God, not with people. She's not worried about competition. She's worried about sustainability. And so if you'll pick up with me in verse 8, it says, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? He doesn't get it. Or maybe he does get it, and he's trying to comfort her. But either way, it's not the same. What Elkanah can offer her in his love is not what she's upset about. She loves Elkanah, but he doesn't get it. But Elkanah, knowing this story, it's not a surprise. It happens every year. You can see in this passage is wrestling probably with his own insecurities. He's wrestling with, well, am I not good enough for Hannah? Like, I don't know. You, you wonder. I don't know. Scripture doesn't say. You wonder if Elkanah wondered. Maybe, maybe I'm doing something wrong. I don't know. Probably not because Panina has kids, but I don't know. And so there's a lot of insecurity here. But it continues on. Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli... The priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. Eli was a judge. It was his job to watch over what was happening inside of the temple at the very least. Even if his kids were terrible on his watch, he made sure that worship was going to be done well and that he was going to fulfill his duty. And Hannah, she was in bitterness of the soul. And she prayed to the Lord and she wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me. Not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor will come upon his head. You see, Hannah took it to the Lord because she understood what she wasn't fighting was not, she wasn't fighting Panina. She wasn't fighting God in her life. Hannah knew, just like scripture tells us, that what was happening would only be brought forth in the spirit, right? And so Hannah goes into her prayer closet. She goes into the temple and she begins to pour out her heart to the Lord. And she's in anguish. She's upset, but she doesn't become venomous. She understands that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but we're fighting against things in the spiritual realm. The pastor, E. Stanley Jones, who was the missionary to India, he said, the early Christians did not say in dismay, look what the world has come to, but rather in delight, look what has come to the world. Hannah could have had, again, a lot of excuses to not be in that temple, to not go in there one more time and contend for one more, one more day. Lord, please do something. Please remember me. Please see me but she moves forward and she grabs on to the Lord. And I wonder how many of us pray like that today. You see, the saints, the older saints, a lot of times they would pray like a battering ram. Luke 18, right? And they would pray and it would be consistent and you would keep coming back and you would wait on the Lord and you didn't just pray when you felt like it, but you prayed until you felt like it. You came in to do business with the Lord and you didn't leave until you felt like he had heard you. And our kids need to see that. They need to see faith like that. They don't need to hear doom and gloom. They don't need to hear your life is so hard. They don't need to hear all the things in the culture because that won't fix their gaze on God. It will fix their gaze on fear. But we serve a powerful God. We serve a good God. And a God who is able to do more and accomplish more than we can dream. Micah 3.8, the prophet says, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. Your kids don't need you to force them to follow Jesus. They need to watch you follow Jesus. They need to see what's going on in your life. So we'll pick up here in verse 12. It says, And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli, he was watching her mouth. You see, Eli wasn't used to, apparently, people coming in and praying things silently. People would come in and they would pray loudly. They would do whatever. And Hannah came in and some days you just don't have it in you. You don't feel like you have that fight. 
And she came in and she could barely squeak out a whisper, right? She's just speaking to the Lord quietly. Her lips are moving, nothing's coming out. Eli thinks that she's drunk because a lot of the women that apparently were coming to the temple um, were engaging in the feast, right? The celebration, they would get drunk and they would wander into the temple and then his sons would do bad things with them. And so what they were, what Eli was afraid was happening was this was another one who had wandered in and he wasn't going to let this happen again. But Hannah wasn't there for that at all. Hannah was there because she was waging war in heaven and she was waging peace on earth, right? And so she was following her husband, following her family, doing what she could. But when she went into her prayer closet, it got serious. It was her and the Lord, and the Lord had the power and the ability to do something. And Hannah was raw with him. She gave the Lord undisguised feelings, right? She didn't hold back. She didn't pretend. She didn't worry about what he would think of her. God knew her heart. So she would just lay it out, and she would go. And what's interesting is as she's praying and God is intertwining her heart with his, what we see is the Lord is about to answer her prayer, but the answer to her prayer is actually the answer to God's desire to see the nation brought back. And so we see that there's this great collision as she's contending between her faith and God's will. And things are about to come together. And so that way, she would be able to be a part of this concert of prayer that the Lord had. And she was willing to have a kid to give him up for the kid's entire life. The desire just weighed on her. Verse 12, it says, she continued praying. The word in the original language is literally she multiplied as she prayed. What does that mean? There's only one Hannah. Nobody is with her. But you know when you go to pray and the Spirit of God prays through you like it says in Romans chapter 8, then the Lord is working through you. He's doing something. And the Lord is responding. There's an anointing that happens within the room. And I believe that as Hannah was praying and it says that she was multiplied to pray, that the Lord was engaging her and the Spirit was also encouraging her to do that. And so in verse 13, we see that she's It said that, uh, I'm sorry, now Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved. Her voice was not heard, and so Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put away your wine. How discouraging for her, right? She shows up, this is where I go if I have a problem, I want to pray. And the guy who's the head, the spiritual leader, tells you, you should get out of here. I don't like how you're approaching this. And because she had heavy emotions and heavy grief, it was nothing for her to be embarrassed about. She was engaging the Lord in a deep way. You know, in World War II, uh, there was a test pilot named Chuck Yeager. And Chuck Yeager uh, was tasked with the job of getting in a plane and flying until he broke the sound barrier, the speed of sound. So essentially, nobody's ever done this. They put him in a really fast plane, and they say, let's see what happens. And Chuck's like, I'll do it. I'm like, okay, crazy. And so he hops in the cockpit, and he gets going. And he, his, he relates that he hit Mach 0.8, and uh, things were rattling. <laughs> Gauges are not doing well. Uh, you're wondering, is this the end? Is this how I'm going to go out? Things are coming. And so sometimes when you're contending, You feel like your life is shaking. It's rattling. There's no payoff yet, but things are hard and things are loud and things are uh, vibrating all around you. And so as that's going on and and Jaeger is there, he said something interesting happened because he was aware that the sheer force could shred him in a second, similar to coming into a prayer room with the fear of God. You know that the Lord is powerful. He could do whatever he wants, but he bends his ear to us. And it said that as he pushed through and he hit 1.3, something weird happened. He slipped into the smooth momentum of the stream. He did it. He broke the speed of sound. And in our prayer rooms, as we contend, it's very similar, right? You rattle, 
you go through, things are hard, the instrument gauges, people are saying, hey, this, that, you should give up, God's not going to do whatever, and you're hearing all these things, it's crazy, and then all of a sudden, you're hurt. You slip into the momentum of heaven to what the Lord is wanting to do, and that's where Hannah found herself. And so she could have responded pretty nastily to Eli. He was wrong. He didn't get hurt. She could have responded from ego or from pride, but she doesn't take that route. Instead, she responds gently. And Hannah shows great character, and she shows great restraint here. Wimber wrote, gifts and abilities, no matter how strong or amazing, are either limited or enhanced by character. I've known a lot of gifted people who waste it. A lot of people who have strong ability. And you know what? It doesn't matter. There's no anointing. There's no character there. And so Hannah, as she responds to him in verse 15, he says, get out of here, you're drunk. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but, and underline this if you want, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. How many of us leave the prayer room and we can say, uh, I gave everything. I poured it out. I exhausted God if there was such a thing, which there's not. But she came in, she does this, and says, Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. So she's honest with him. She stays soft. She recognizes he's doing his job. Some people, when they're challenged or they're grieving or they're in a difficult spot, what happens is they can allow themselves to be consumed by self, by bitterness. And what happens is you see a slow dripping acid that begins to release in some people's souls, that begins to, to sour them, to ruin them. But our troubles can be great vehicles that we can take to God, right? They can lead us, press us into him. And so in this season of pain, Hannah had also made discoveries about the Lord, what his personality is like, what his character is like, what it looks like to press in, to stand in faith. I can be honest with him. He cares for me. I'm going to continue worshiping regardless of what other people say. That's not the point. Samuel, or sorry, Eli is moved by this and says, then Eli answered and said, well, go in peace. The God of Israel, grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And so the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer set. You see what happened is her faith pulled up her countenance and her soul, right? She had been heard. She didn't leave with the baby that Eli had found and gave to her, but she left with a promise. And the promise of God is just as good as having something in hand because God doesn't lie. People lie when they're afraid. God's not afraid of you. God doesn't need to prove anything to you, but he is faithful and he is merciful and he does love you. And so she goes away expectant. But as she goes home, she's going to find there's a moment of truth. I have the promise of the Lord, but now what? We're going to find out, right? Alcana and I are going to go home and we'll see what happens. But it doesn't scare her off. She continues to go. If you're taking notes, the last point is contending faith isn't just about giving good answers. It's also about asking Good questions. Discipleship or teaching someone to follow the Lord is not an information dump, but it's rather teaching somebody the ways of the Lord to lead them deeper into him. It's teaching somebody to think critically about their faith. My wife is a teacher, and she was in a situation in a classroom with some children and she was teaching high school. It was a government class. And uh, so they're all having a discussion around abortion. And a lot of the people in this particular class were children that were believers uh, or were Mormon who have strong moral grids but did not know Jesus. And so they, they were gathered together talking about abortion. And Lauren goes, you know, what's the stance? And uh, a lot of the kids raised their hand and said, no, like we respect life. Life is precious, which is true. It's like, good. 
And then she goes, now let's talk about euthanasia. People who are suffering, people who are in difficulty. What do you think about that? And the kids thought about it and they thought, yeah, that's fine. Because you see what had happened was there was a disconnect fundamentally. The kids were taught to parrot, to repeat what the parents wanted, but they weren't taught to think critically about their faith. They couldn't make the jump from one to the other. As we do discipleship, it can be really healthy and strengthening for us to struggle. It's good for us to wrestle with questions. If somebody gives you something, you don't always respect it because you didn't have to earn it. When you earn things, when you struggle, you get to know the Lord, you value pieces of who he is and what he does. And so what we see is that Hannah was there. She was willing to go home. In verse 19, it says, and they arose early in the morning and they worshiped before the Lord. Before they even went home to try and get the promise, they worshiped God. Thank you, God. God, you're good. Thank you. I'll trust you for this. You see, it wasn't name it and claim it. It wasn't something they just came up with and claimed, but it was rather promised and purposed. It was something the Lord had given and put in there. Catherine Booth, who was the co-founder of the Salvation Army, had this thought, and she said, if we are to better the future, then we must disturb the present. You see, comfort is not always your friend. And sometimes we have to ask uncomfortable questions, or we have to go places where the Lord draws us that stretch us and take us out of the realm of what we like, because God has something for us that we would have never gone to on our own if we weren't faithful, to just let him do his thing. Just let him lead. In the early church, there was a group of believers that were called the gamblers. And these people uh, took their name from the Greek idea of not regarding your life. And so what they would do is they would go to places specifically where there were prisoners and they would meet with them. They would go to places where the plague had broken out and people would toss bodies on the street and they would run away because they were afraid. And these believers would go in and they would bury the bodies and they would take care of the sick because they didn't regard their lives as more precious than the ministry of Jesus. And it's powerful. They risk their lives to show the love of Jesus. And so I want to encourage you today, if you're in a place where you feel apathetic, uh, turn to the Lord. Because spiritual apathy might be a more comfortable way for your life, your spiritual life to die, but it's still fatal. It's not good for you. God has something for you. He made you for something. So Hannah goes home and she's got to now face one of her greatest fears again. Right? Because in Hebrew culture, barrenness was a sign of instability, right? Things pass through the male air. And so if you can't have kids financially, what does that mean for you if your husband dies before you? What does that mean for where you live? What does that mean for everything about your life? And so in, in this culture, it was extremely difficult when you couldn't do that, but Hannah has a a humility and a willingness to follow God and wrestle with hard things. And so she goes home and she engages. How many of us are at that place in our journey this morning? The Lord has spoken to you or given you a promise or wants to do something through you and you haven't taken him up on it. You're afraid. It might make sense. You might have some really great reasons except that God can do it. And so you have to wonder, where am I at with the Lord and my trust of the Lord? And I'm not judging you or pointing the finger at you. I I have issues in my life where I come to and I wrestle through this deeply, wrestle with it with my wife. But Hannah knew that either she could draw near to the Lord or drift away from him in fear. And so she presses in. So it says, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And so it came to pass in the process of time. You can underline that. It wasn't immediate, but in the process of time, it came about. Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. 
saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned. Then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. See, Hannah probably wasn't in a hurry to give up the baby that she'd been praying for and waiting for. But what was going to happen was the Lord had set out a destiny, a path for Samuel. And if Hannah was too controlling or tinkered or meddled in his life, she was going to mess with what the Lord had called that child to. And as parents, we understand the fear, but you also can't get in the way of what the Lord is doing. And so she calls him Samuel because it means heard of God. She saw the tenderness of the Lord in being heard. Everything came to pass. Elkanah goes up and makes his own vow. And then in verse 24, it's time. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bowls, one ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. He's probably three years old, culturally. Then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here, praying to the Lord. Now she's going to encourage Eli's faith. Remember that? God came through. For this child I prayed, the Lord has granted me my pet- petition, which I asked him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he will be lent to the Lord. And so what happens? What does this family do? Difficult times, they're giving up their child to the Lord. They worship. Their kids were literally their sacrifice of worship. They offered their kid to the Lord. And they said, here, Lord, have your way with them. I can trust you. You're good. Yes, Eli doesn't have a good track record. It's true. His kids didn't turn out well. But there is something in this where Eli will help Samuel along a little bit. And what you see in Eli is that some of us are really good at discipling other people's kids, but not our own. And there's grace for that. Children grow. They have free will. They can make their own decisions. But I want you to remember to invest in your children. We need to remember that we have to be spiritually tenacious. Everything is not just brought to us. Sometimes, the Lord <clears throat> asks us to contend and to allow for that partnership and that tension to happen in order to birth something beautiful in us. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. And I want you to consider if the Lord is having you contend for something this morning, what is it? Maybe it's health. Or maybe it's a prodigal. Or maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's you. Maybe you're here and you find yourself spiritually just dead. And you know what? You've been okay with that. You've been comfortable. And the Lord is touching you and the Spirit of God is saying, it's not okay. You need to repent and stop sinning against the Lord. Job chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Yet man has been born into trouble as surely as the sparks fly upward. Right? We, we find ourselves in trouble. It's almost like we can't help it. We're sinful people. But we have to take that to the Lord. And if you do, even if you find yourself here this morning and you're spiritually dead, you need to know that Jesus is a prolific grave robber. He has the ability and the power this morning as we've been talking and he's been praying for you to bring you back to life. To let the Spirit of God Move freely in you again. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I want to encourage you that Jesus is God. He understands your inability to fix things on your own. He understands that you have brokenness and sin in your life. And so what he did is he left heaven and came to earth. He lived among us so that we can see him and relate to him. And then he died on our behalf, brutally crushed and murdered in order to be a sacrifice for sin, to make a way for us to have relationship with God. And if you don't know Jesus this morning, I want to encourage you, 
You should come with me to Jesus. You'll never regret it. I don't know your situation. I don't know where you're at. But if you're naturally dead in your sin, what a dead person needs is to be reborn. You need to be born again. You need to allow the Spirit of God to touch you and to bring you to life. And he has that power this morning. So if you're here and you don't know Jesus, I would like to pray for you. And I know that it's scary and it could be intimidating, but also know that it will always be worth it. Is there anybody here who would slip up their hand who would like to give their life to Jesus? I can pray with you. Okay. It could be some on the radio, some online. And then if you're here this morning and you're just wrestling with the Lord, you have a lot of questions, you don't have a lot of answers, I want to invite you to press into God. We're going to have pastors up here at the front. Uh, We would love to pray with you. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.